And um, next up is the evaluation of customer service at the Department of Employment Security. And I think we have three additional people f presenting from the State Auditor's Office. So please join us at the front. Good afternoon, Chair and members of the committee. My name is Emily Simber. I'm a Senior Performance Auditor with the Washington State Auditor's Office. And presenting with me today are my colleagues, Corey Crowley-Hall and Jolene Stanislavski. We are here to present the report Evaluating Customer Service at Washington's Department of Employment Security. But before I get started, I would just like to take a moment to really thank the Employment Security Department for all of their cooperation and the time that they gave throughout this audit. We found that ESD completed most, but not all of the requirements of engrossed substitute Senate Bill 5193. Improvement in core customer service areas such as call centers and payment times really only materialized after claimant volumes fell significantly. Some key initiatives to improve customer service have not been successful and ESD lacks a robust performance management framework. Our office issued an audit during the 2021 legislative session that identified the significant challenges ESD faced in responding to the crisis. This audit was requested by legislators and is a follow-up on that audit. This audit also included a review of engrossed substitute Senate Bill 5193, which passed during the 2021 legislative session and required ESD to implement a number of changes to improve customer service, as well as to report quarterly to the legislature on certain performance metrics. This audit examined customer service at ESD and looked at whether ESD met the requirements of 5193, the extent of customer service improvements, the agency's performance management and monitoring, and practices in other states. I'm now going to hand it over to Corey, who will present the results for our first two audit questions. Thank you, Emily. And I'm Corey Crowley Hall, performance auditor who worked on this project. In general, we found that ESD met most of the mandates of 5193. In this presentation, we focus on the areas that were most challenging for the agency. Reserve adjudicator pool monitoring, providing access for only the intended audience when establishing dedicated phone lines, legislative reporting requirements, and revising letters to claimants. 5193 required ESD to establish a reserve adjudicator program that would create a pool of adjudicators that could be quickly activated in the event of another unemployment crisis. This reserve pool has the potential to address a core difficulty processing claims during the pandemic, but by the time our fieldwork ended, we did not see evidence that ESD could activate many of its adjudicators. ESD offered the training to temporary staff hired during the pandemic, previous e ESD interns, and HCA employees. We found that ESD has no formal evaluation process for the training, and therefore participants have no means to give systematic feedback on whether the training can be improved upon. Additionally, as of July 2022, ESD did not have contact information for many of the 400 reserve adjudicators who have completed the training and therefore cannot activate all of them quickly if called upon. ESD began to formalize procedures to manage their list more effectively. ESD had already established specialized phone lines for claimants with disabilities and limited English proficiency prior to the pandemic. However, when call volumes were at their worst in the midst of the pandemic, many claimants overwhelmed specialized phone lines in order to get through to talk to a claim specialist at ESD. While ESD is researching this problem, by the end of our field work in July, ESD said they had not found a way to ensure that a line for people who lack access or skills with computers could only be used by the target audience and had not opened such a line. We found that ESD did not report clearly on all of the required measures. There were two types of measures that ESD did not report clearly. First, call center metrics blended the employer line and the claimant line. The trends in these two lines were very different and reporting them as one prevents the legislature from understanding what happened in the employer line. 
Second, total claims pending in adjudication and total claims where payment has been halted for review were blended and reported under the heading of claims pending, which is difficult to understand how or if it relates to the information that the legislature asked for. An additional concern that claimants had during the pandemic was that ESD sent out letters that were difficult to understand and were sometimes perceived as threatening. ESD prioritized some of the most common letter types for revision and identified five templates to revise, of which it has completed all five. When we asked how many total letter templates exist, ESD was unable to quantify them for us beyond the five that it chose to revise. Additionally, ESD has revised nine drop-in paragraphs used to customize individual letters and has 131 in progress out of a total of 706 drop-in paragraphs. ESD said that this was phase one of the letter revision project, but has not identified what future work it might do on letter revision. We found that revised letters were not always clear and comprehensible. Only one letter passed both of our assessments and four letters passed one of our assessments. The reevaluate claim letter was particularly difficult for our readers. Specifically, our readers expressed confusion over whether the letter was saying that the claimant is eligible for an overpayment waiver and whether the claimant needs to do anything to initiate the waiver process. We analyzed time series trends in some key customer service areas to identify whether ESD was able to improve since the previous audit. We looked at call center performance and payment timeliness. Improvements in these two areas were only sustained after claim volumes fell to below pre-pandemic levels. In general, ESD's performance tracked closely with the workload, and even as ESD increased staffing, that staffing was insufficient to keep up with the unprecedented demand through the pandemic period that only relaxed towards the end of 2021. Prior to the pandemic, ESD had about an 80% answered call rate. You can see the answered call rate in green and the terminated call rate in orange. That fell to under 25% of calls answered in 2020 and 2021. After claim volumes fell to below pre-pandemic levels, ESD's monthly answered call rate returned into the 70s. Hold times followed a similar pattern. Payment times increased all the way to May of 2021 and have improved recently as claimant volumes fell to below pre-pandemic levels, but remain well above the 30 to 40 day range seen prior to the pandemic. To relieve pressure on the phone systems, ESD created a virtual assistant to answer basic questions. The virtual assistant operates on an artificial intelligence program that determines what the user is trying to ask and pulls in the best answer from a list of intents. When we tested the virtual assistant, we found that some types of question word, for some types of question wording, it returned helpful responses. For example, when we asked, how do I apply for unemployment? The virtual assistant told the user where to go in order to apply for benefits, as well as the phone number to apply over the phone. However, it was very sensitive to specific question wordings and could not accurately answer some questions. When we asked, how do I file for unemployment? The virtual assistant just encouraged the user to apply without any explanation for how to do so. Other questions yielded no usable results at all. We identified that a general lack of performance management contributed to ESD's difficulty improving its customer service in the face of the crisis. And Jolene will tell you more about that as I hand this over to her. Thank you, Corey. As Corey mentioned, I'm Jolene Stanislavski, a performance auditor on the team. And as mentioned in the report, ESD has some good elements of a performance management system, but taken as a whole, it is not robust enough to improve customer service. Using guidance from OFM and other professional sources, 
we reviewed ESD's performance management related to customer service by looking at their strategic planning, customer service projects and programs, and the performance measures throughout. What we learned about their strategic planning is that ESD's previous plan for 2019-2020 had three elements that, if completed, could have established some data baselines and a gap analysis which could have informed future performance goals and measures. While deadlines for these activities were prior to the pandemic, current planning efforts did not include them. And without baseline data, leaders cannot create measures with benchmarking, which is an important part of an effective performance management system. In reviewing ESD's most up-to-date documents as of July 2022 on their draft strategic plan, there is still not defined actionable performance measures related to customer service. For their customer service projects, ESD does not have projects tied to their strategic plan, nor does ESD have effective transition plans for their customer service projects. One way to ensure efforts help move government agencies toward their strategic goals is to review projects within that context. And while ESD categorizes their projects under different strategic goals and tracks the health of the project, they do not have any indicators showing how the project meets any agency performance measures. For example, a measure that tracks whether the virtual assistant correctly answers questions could help managers know if it is successful in helping decrease barriers for customers or if course correction is required. As for transitioning projects into operations, a handoff plan that includes how results will be monitored once in operations would help ensure performance continues and can be adjusted if measures indicate a need. ESD does not have transition to operations plans for many of its customer service projects, and the one they had did not have any steps for creating ongoing monitoring. As for their performance measures, pardon me, ESD is required to track performance measures for federal and state government, but these are not included in their strategic plan and therefore not linked to overall agency strategy. Currently, ESD relies on reactive federal correction plans, which are required when certain measures drop below federal standards. ESD does not relate the federal measures to its broader goals outlined in its strategic plan. And in fact, the most recent strategic plan only had one performance measure related to customer service. Without an effective performance management system, leaders are less equipped to monitor performance and make strategic decisions to better serve the public. However, there's only so much that performance management can account for when an emergency hits. But ESD does not yet have updated emergency plans to address this. Our last objective was to identify good practices from other states. Our team reached out to other states to discover promising customer service practices by looking at states that on average performed better than Washington for federal performance measures. The states we spoke with identified several practices which are detailed in the report and briefly listed here on the screen. Uh, for example, one of the practices was ensuring customers can complete all of their needs reliably online without the need to make a call, which frees up the line for those who really need the most help. Managers at ESD reviewed the list of practices and said they have either completed or plan to complete all of the practices we shared. I'll now hand it back to Emily, who will present our recommendations to the agency. Thank you, Jolene. So to address what we learned in the performance audit, we make a series of 13 recommendations in our report, and I'll go through a very high level review of those recommendations. We recommend a number of steps to address the issues that we found for completing 5193 requirements. Among them, we recommend that ESD ensure processes put in place to monitor that reserve adjudicator pool are operating as designed. We also recommend that ESD establish processes to monitor training program outcomes, continue working to establish a dedicated telephone line for those with limited computer skills, 
and ensure that it's clearly and accurately updating the legislature on progress made in delivering 5193 requirements. To address customer service challenges and the tracking of performance, we recommend a number of actions in our report, namely that ESD develop a process to better track and monitor customer service, implement systematic tracking of call volume and call center staffing levels over time, better track virtual assistant performance, and better track projects and ensure alignment with strategic planning efforts. We do recognize that the agency provided a detailed response to our findings. The information that the agency provided in that response either fell outside of the timeframe for our audit, or it did not include any new information that we had not already assessed during the audit timeframe. Thank you very much. That completes our presentation and we are now available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Um, let's bring up uh, Employment Security and Commissioner Feek um, and staff, and then we'll, I think that'll be better for uh, ask questions of everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us in person. Please introduce the team. Absolutely. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Paulette and committee. I'm Cami Feek, the commissioner here at Employment Security Department. And with me today, I am happy to introduce J.R. Richards. She is the director for our Unemployment Insurance Customer Service Division, as well as Caitlin Jekyll, who is our government's relations director. You want to present? Sure, I wasn't sure if you just want an introduction oh, oh. or if you wanted our no, no, response. Please. My apologies. <laughs> uh, getting back to in person, I guess, like it's a real thing. Um, so uh, my, apologize, my apologies. We really are, um, appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, the customer service in the unemployment insurance program and all of the uh, programs at Employment Security Department are something that I take very seriously. Our team has, um, I think, every way possible analyzed what has happened over the last several years. Um, we have embarked on really fundamental core culture and system change within the organization. And the executive team along with me are really committed to that. I think what you heard today from the auditor's office, we fully embrace all of their recommendations. There is a lot we have done, um, and I think that our plan this afternoon is to share in a little bit more depth some of that. I do want to specifically address strategic planning. I think that was one of the biggest um, challenges for me in terms of timing. Um, the auditor's office, when they completed their audit, we were completing our strategic plan, a four-year strategic plan. Um, four years after what we went through in the last two without time to think about sort of facing uh, ahead a couple weeks, four years is a lot. Um, mm -hmm. That particular plan has three primary goals that are all absolutely related at the highest level to customer experience and customer service. Um, and they fall around, one, our own employee enga engagement and experience, right, of keeping a qualified team, having them trained, and ha investing in our people. The other is all about organizational excellence. It's recognizing that the foundations across um, this work, our systems, um, need to function well along with the people that are doing this work. And the third area is all about holistic service delivery. They all have both at the highest level goals, they have strategies, they have tactics, and they have measures. And we have a process that we are building to both report out against that. Um, and we, uh, that prior plan that was addressed, we wrapped up and looked at what within that would in, intentionally carry forward. Um, beneath that are all division playbooks. So when you talk about customer service and customer experience in a specific program like our unemployment insurance program, that playbook for the division level work is where those measures show up about that division's performance and the work of that division. And that has all happened subsequent to this audit. And it's I just share that for context um, when we talk about performance and, and a performance system 
of course, is um, above and beyond those things that I just mentioned. Um, I want to turn it over to JR because I think JR um, is in her position in the best, um, has the best perspective from a day to day activity within that work to talk about our customer improvement strategies and where we've moved with some big things, some smaller things, um, and to be really transparent about the things we're done. Uh, the things left to do, and the things that we know are still on the horizon. So I'm going to hand it over to you, JR. Thank you, Cammie. Good afternoon, JR Richards. I'm the new ish uh, director of unemployment uh, insurance customer service support. I joined in this position mid June of this last year, so I think I'm just a little bit over six months now. And you know, what really drew me to this particular position was the agency's uh, dedication and investment in improving customer service and uh, using what we learned during the, during the pandemic to uh, make measurable improvements in service delivery. And so I believe we shared a slide deck with you or maybe a handout, so just to orient. So the, the first slide there, really what I wanna talk about is our customer service continuous improvement strategy. And I use the term strategy intentionally instead of plan because Strategy encompasses all. It encompasses both the measurable actions that we're taking, think project plan on paper, uh, or action plan on paper, and the short and long-term approach to sustainable improvements. It's really about creating a culture of continuous improvement that will last long after I am in this position. Uh, the snapshot I share with you is just that, it's a snapshot. There is not enough space in the presentation to share all of the different areas, but I wanted to call out a few key things and some that I think that you all will uh, find valuable and important. So the strategy encompasses many things. So for example, the Senate bill uh, mandated needed reform to address our customer service issues. And out of that, you see action plans and project plans that are things like standing up a phone line to serve certain customers, uh, improving the readability of our letters. Additionally, as part of our strategy, we have the state quality service plan. This is federally mandated. All states are required to do this. There's about 15 measures that we're held accountable to and we regularly report out on. Uh, those th include things like payment timeliness, adjudication quality, adherence to laws and rules, fraud. Uh, this is the area that you would see that pen on paper action plan if we fall short in one of these areas and miss a measure. And know that we work really closely with USDOL to uh, make changes when we are getting close to missing a measure, along with a very close partnership with them if we do or when we do to have a clear action plan to be able to move us back into acceptable levels of performance in one of those measures. The other area, and I think one I'm most excited about, that was, is the unemployment insurance project portfolio. And this was stood up early 2022, so it was something that I was able to come into and help with uh, some of the building of this program. And it's really about centralizing projects that are related in our agency to unemployment insurance in a single place and applying a methodology to be able to focus on the right work. And I think the easiest way to say this is it's really about getting more of the right things done by doing fewer fewer things at once. Uh, the final one that I mentioned on there is the holistic service delivery. I think this one's really important because this is where we focus on outcomes and the changes that we intend to see. It's the lens that we use uh, with decision making and where to focus our limited resources. It's how we approach service delivery in our agency uh, across all of our lines of business to create a seamless customer experience. And I'm not gonna go into each one of the things under those, I listed a couple that you may be familiar with. Now, I would like to note that uh, you'll see a project that is in, uh, say, Senate Bill 5193, that would also be in the UI project portfolio so that we're, we're ensuring that it has the right resources and availability to get the work done in a timely manner in a meaningful way. So let me talk about how I'm using all of that, right? Because I just shared strategy and there's much more to it. Uh, we tie our metrics directly into how we use this work. So key performance metrics are used to both drive and to measure our continuous improvement strategy. So as example, I'll focus on call center data. Uh, 
I know in the audit it called out reporting around shortcomings in our data that could impact our ability to respond to incoming call volumes. And we actually do have detailed call statistics and workload staffing models that we use. Uh, our staff who answer calls also answer customer emails and they also do the adjudication work. So we rely heavily on these models to know where to flex our staff depending on what's happening with workloads. Uh, for calls specifically, there's really two levers we can pull when call volumes spike and they do spike seasonally. We're actually in a seasonal spike right now. It happens every year. Uh, and that is you put more folks on the phones or you stop calls from coming in. Those are the two levers. Putting more staff on the phones, which might help in the very near term, actually doesn't help us in the long term because it takes staff off of adjudicating the work, which then drives calls. Uh, it really is expensive and in some ways it's inefficient. So really what we're focusing our action plan on is reducing the need for a customer to call us. And we're doing that with both long-term and short-term strategies. So long-term strategies like you saw on the first slide would be things like uh, the letters project, uh, which uh, you know, mandated. Um, we know that if a letter is not confusing or if it is confusing, a customer is going to call us. And so it makes sense to put time, energy, and effort into clear, concise letters that reduce the need for a customer to call. Uh, we're also launching in April of 2023 a new phone system. Uh, it really is going to, like it's business re-engineering. It's changing how we do work that actually better serves our customers as far as navigation, usability, uh, their experience. It also gives us greater flexibility in uh, managing the ebbs and flows of our workload volumes. Uh, I think last time ESD was here, Representative Pollitt, you specifically mentioned our virtual assistant at the time, which was not functioning well. Uh, we did bring in, as was called out in the audit, a, a new product with AI. That needs more work. We have to continue this work. Um, so while we have seen some improvements and that it is supporting a certain percentage of call volumes with simpler questions, not complex questions, we know. We just recently went back to the vendor and said, this isn't, we want more, so we need to do a better job. So while we've implemented that project, we have optimization that's kicking off when the, with the vendor at no charge to us, by the way, in March to optimize and improve the responsiveness of this product. We're taking a very hard line with that with our vendor to deliver on what they said they would deliver on. Um, all of these are longer term strategies to reduce calls to come in. These are not all we're doing, but they're just a few that I wanted to call out. Uh, additionally, we're implementing a uh, integrated customer survey, um, and more for just not just getting customer experience, but knowing where to focus our efforts. Where are customers getting stuck? Where are they getting confused in the process? We also hear this from our stakeholders and our community partners, and then focusing our action plan and our efforts on those areas specifically. And so as it's tied to this project around call volumes, those are actions we're taking. But what are we doing today? Uh, I said that we have a seasonal spike of call volumes. We are able to see the types of calls that are coming in uh, and then addressing are there call volume types, even if it's 20%, 10%, that we could reduce with better information on our website, with new updates on our FAQs, with changing a great example as we were receiving calls on some verbiage in Spanish that didn't say what it needed to say for understanding. It was a simple change that we were able to identify that stopped those calls from coming in altogether. So that's work we're doing immediately. Um, but some customers still can't get through. So I'm also partnering with my other division, Employment Connections and the WorkSource offices, knowing that they often get the overflow of our customers that can't get through to us. We have trained unemployment insurance ambassadors. We provide them regular information so that they also have the ability to help and support as we continue to work on better managing the volumes that come in. My goal for the future is that natural seasonal spikes should not impact the customer's experience and we know we have some work to do to get there. And really going into that very last slide, which is more of a snapshot of some of the actions we've taken or are taking to improve customer experience, we have made significant strides, many since July, as you saw in our response. Um, the work you've asked us to do in Senate Bill 5193, together with the strategic direction that I am moving the department, are the right work. 
Uh, it's a journey. Changing accumulated practices that have been in place for decades takes time, especially if we want to do so in a meaningful way. And honestly, I really am looking forward to and excited about the opportunity to be able to come back in the future and share the continued progress we're making in this work. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Caitlin for closing remarks. Great, thank you so much. For the record, Caitlin Jekyll, Government Relations Director for Employment Security Department. So to close, I wanna return back to some of the content of the audit and the agency response that we submitted to you all. The auditor's final recommendations, as you heard a moment ago, simply reaffirmed what they shared in their initial audit, that they urged the department to follow through on these recommendations. And the bottom line is we agree. This is the right work and we're working on it. JR just gave you an overview of some key points from the division. And I wanted to follow up with a few more things that highlight progress that we've made on these recommendations since the close of the audit period in July. ESD just submitted its final quarterly report on its performance on 5193 to the legislature. And in that, I would call out that at this point, we have 488 active and trained adjudicators in that pool. We're the first state in this nation to have stood up a reserve adjudicator pool in this way. And we have repaired the identified issue that was mentioned by the auditor's office on how we track and make sure that we're remaining active in the contact information so that we can deploy that pool. We have finalized initial revisions on 711 individual segments of text, which were referred to as drop-ins. These are the individual pieces that drag over into the letter to compile the um, unique letter based on the nature of that claim. So 711 individual segments of text are completed. And our final dedicated phone line is now live and serving those customers mentioned who have identified technology barriers. The audit suggested generally uh, that re reduced claim volume was the primary driver for why we've seen improved metrics in call center and payment times. And certainly, you saw on the chart the significant reduction in incoming claim volume associated with pandemic recovery certainly was the biggest driver in why the customer experience has improved. Um, however, we would dispute an assertion that these other efforts have failed because these are significant and ongoing projects and the audit offers a snapshot in time. The scale of this work we would like to relay today just simply cannot be understated. There are a couple of pieces that JR mentioned that I'd like to reiterate that we expect are gonna have the greatest impact on improving those metrics that were mentioned in the audit, um, but are not yet showing up in the numbers. A revision of written materials is the first. As JR mentioned, when written material doesn't make sense, you know, we know the first thing people do is pick up the phone to try to reach somebody to ask for clarity on what they have to do to be successful in their claim. This is inefficient. It's really important that these written materials make sense. So as I mentioned, each of these individual sections of text are customized. They then compile um, to become the information that the claimant sees. The basic structure of these letters are currently in production. The, the overarching sort of framework is there. And these individual drop-ins are going in batches to consumer testing. That work is underway right now. So claimants aren't reading the letters in full yet that reflect that body of work, but that consumer testing is underway. And we expect all of this work um, to be completed in June. That said, this is an iterative process. So once these letters are in production, consumer testing doesn't end. We expect to continue to refine this as we go. You heard from the State Auditor's Office some questions on the readability of the letters as well as um, there were remarks in the audit around compliance um, with the law as far as references to legal citations in the letters. Um, ESD approached the structure and content design quite deliberately based on the feedback that we heard from the consumers that read these letters. So where you see throughout the body of the letter um, the description of legal requirements using plain talk principles and all of those citations listed at the close of the letter, that was based on that consumer feedback that we heard from individuals who are reading these on what makes most sense for them to use the content. The other piece that JR mentioned was our phone system that will go live in April. For claimants who do need to reach us by phone, this change will be significant. So you heard about high volume call messages where people call and they simply just cannot reach us. This is gonna be a pivotal change in this phone system where claimants will be empowered to schedule a call that suits their time and ensure that they get a call back that meets that need. 
and that we internally will be able to triage our adjudicator resources based on the nature of that claim. So someone who's available to take the call, who's qualified to actually manage the issue the claimant has, will be who can take them off of that queue. This is going to be um, incredibly important. It will allow the tracking of the dedicated phone lines that the audit recommends that we have that level of sophistication and it provides the department the type of performance measurement that we know that you all expect of us. So where the audit notes functionality is lacking now, we certainly are not here to tell you that it's not. We agree, but the work to address these gaps is underway. So in closing, we're confident that the direction that we're going is aligned with the state auditor's recommendation and their assessment that upon completion of these recommendations, measurable difference will be made for the individuals who seek service from ESD. Um, our agency response goes through in um, pretty significant detail, point by point, if there are additional things that we didn't address today, including more on our strategic plan and our staffing model. We sent you all a summary document on our uh, customer service improvement efforts, and as I mentioned, we've uh, produced the final 5193 report. With that, if there are additional things we can talk about today, we're um, here for questions. We clearly have some questions. Mm -hmm. uh, you're shocked. Um, and for questions, um, please identify if you'd like SAO to respond as well. Um, so, uh, so just alerting our SAO team on, you know, to be able to respond also. All right, <clears throat> Representative Orcutt. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this was for <coughs> ESD. Um, I just heard um, why the customer service experience has improved. Uh, I have an email in front of me that I'm going to read. It's very brief. Dealing with unemployment and appeals has been a nightmare. I can never get a hold of anyone. When I do end up getting a hold of a person, they give me the runaround and send me elsewhere. They have yet to respond to any of my messages through Secure Access website. And that's where they always instruct me to go. I was off work a while back, and something was answered wrong, apparently. So when I appealed the case, I was waiting for a hearing in which I never received. They ended up sending me a failure to appear and denied my case. Now they want me to pay back, and I'm going to the sum of money. Um, that may sound like an email that we're all receiving in April of 2020. This, in fact, came in two days ago. So you addressed some of it and gave us some hope that some of this is going to be addressed. Can you tell me when all aspects of this are going to be addressed? And I should expect not to be getting emails like this again. Yeah, I can, uh, and I, I hear these same things and recognize the human impact because it is a real impact of addressing all of them. I didn't talk about appeals specifically. Uh, there are outstanding appeals. Uh, we do know that more there are customers that are having this exact same experience. There are a lot of different reasons why it happens, so there isn't a single fix. Uh, what I can say is that we are working very closely with OAH to uh, support with the backlog that they are working through right now. Um, what we're sending over for appeals is definitely uh, gone down. We've also implemented a process to look at re-adjudication before it goes over, meaning someone has eyes on before every appeal is sent over to see if there's something else we can do in the claim. Um, so those are just a few without knowing the specifics of this individual. I will say that there's an escalation process and we do look at those. Um, but there's a lot of work to do. I mean, there's a lot of areas to improve customer service. The snapshot I showed you is just one. So to answer the question, like, when will you never get those? Um, I don't know if I could honestly answer that. What I can say is that we are making measurable, actionable, real improvements that you can see on paper in each of these areas right now. I want to just add a, a couple pieces to that. Um, I know JR started out saying she joined us six months ago. Um, one of many reasons JR was hired into this position, she doesn't have an unemployment insurance background. Um, she has a background in improving call centers. She has a background in technology, big technology delivery projects, and a clear vision around customer experience. 
that's really critical for, for me, for whomever is in that position. Um, I've also created, we've done some um, structural changes with how we're um, organized and have created um, some positions with some sole responsibilities around service delivery and specifically holistic service delivery. Because across programs, um, I, I want to be clear that we have visibility to what those experiences are, but also um, to the point in the audit and the intention in our current strategic plan and how we're aligning that along with portfolio with customer and product, customer experience and product development and these pieces of the puzzle together that we're understanding the, the causes of those be, because they often, those cases are very unique when you peel them back, but at the core there are some fundamental things that contribute. And so while we, I can't give you a date today, what I can tell you is that our path to that improvement has greatly accelerated through some of the foundational pieces that we, we have in place, some of the changes that we have made, and some of these bigger pieces that are coming. To be able to say, like, where did somebody get bumped from, like, a line to somewhere else and their issue wasn't resolved? That's hard to see today. And what I will also tell you is that our escalation line we take very seriously and the team that looks into those is feeding back to our customer experience team what they're learning so that the adjustments we can make, and I just heard of one recently where language on our website resulted in 80% of the time someone not getting what they needed the first time, right? And now we're making a change in that language and the, the response and the percent of success on first time getting the information they need is, is flipping. It's a small example, but if we're not prepared to feed that customer experience, that person that's your, in your inbox, right, of actually having a conversation with that person and figuring out what happened with them, the not getting through on the phone is one thing, but getting through and then not getting what you need and getting it resolved is a whole different thing that we're really intentional about right now. We have really good people doing working really hard to help people in our agency, and we need to make sure that we have visibility on whether we have the right tools, we have the right processes, and we're, we're doing that in a way that people get the issues like are in your your inbox resolved. Um, looking, uh, if uh, Representative Berg, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I wasn't sure where to jump in. So, um, thank you for the presentation because I, I, I agree. Um, with some of the frustrations I've heard my colleagues express up here, I think we were all kind of subject to some of that uh, venting from our constituents. But so just so I understand completely, um, it sounds like there was a timing issue with the auditing report. I'm just trying to get a timeline in my brain. You were already doing kind of this four year move forward improvement plan. We had the auditors come in. Um, it sounds like a lot of what they found, you're in this continuous improvement process. And um, thank you for sharing your background because that's really helpful to know that you come from that sector because I think the call center experience is very, very valuable, that customer service centric experience and even the language that you've used in your presentation presentation speaks to that. So I kind of had that feeling of, um, of maybe a business background. So, so I'm just wondering, do I have that right? Is it, it sounds like timing wise, if this audit was done, let's say six months later, the findings would have been more in, um, in line with what you're currently doing and some of these activities will have been completed. Absolutely. So uh, to put a finer point on that, they wrapped up in July. Our agency strategic plan was finalized in July, so they'd already collected information and done, you know, the snapshot of what our performance was. We then built out these other pieces, right, these divisional playbooks. Um, there are many things that were fully in process, um, 
letters project is another great example of like foundationally the work on that accelerate, accelerated dramatically when we really got to a spot where we are doing portfolio management. And what that means, and uh, I think JR said it very well, but I'll give you a better perspective and finer point on that. At the agency level, we have had a really strong project management office. We have had um, strong projects, but the visibility to look at those in context of a line of business and prioritize and have your top five, and, and JR said it really well, to do less things at the same time and get more done. So we are really moving to be a lot more agile in our work. And that has accelerated some things because the visibility is different at like everything the agency's doing all at once versus JR is now the executive sponsor of an un unemployment insurance portfolio of work. She has product and customer experience in that. She has IT in that. She has the right players at the table to shift and move this work much quicker. And that transformation and that fundamental work to get us to the spot to align that way took some effort and we are there. And so it's, um, we, we've been doing a lot of work. Our, our phone project's another great example of like, we did a full blown requirements, RFP, solicitation, vendor, like, and we're gonna go live in April, that's awesome. That work has been happening, right? Like we've been doing things, but we are at a point where I think the combination of um, shift in how we're really driving the culture, the leadership team that's very aligned in how we do this and what this looks like across the organization um, and having some of the structures and processes to really support that transformational change and shift is in place and much of that did happen or was like n the, the result of that had not happened by the time the audit was wrapped up. Um, phone line, the number of letters we've gotten done, those are all really, I think, you know, JR came out in June, or we were in the middle of getting all of this portfolio set up and really great people were working really hard to do these things, but I think just that, um, prioritization and driving of some of these things we're, we're getting more done um, more quickly by doing fewer things at once. And I would just add to that, Representative Berg, that at any point, however, you know, look at it another six months from now, you're hearing a presentation today of some of the biggest projects that the agency has underway. So no matter where you would cut the line, this is what we're working on. So um, it's unfortunate, certainly, that much of what we've been able to share is the progress we've made since July. But if you spoke to us in another two months, this whole landscape looks different then as well. Um, just a quick follow-up, because it made me think, you described a lot of projects, a lot of workload. Um, I know a lot of us, it came to our attention with the pandemic, right? And, and just that complete need and community how is that workload going now? I mean, it, it feels like there was a lot of um, influx of federal dollars and different things to maybe build up structurally some of the things you've been working on, but has the workload, are you seeing it kind of peak and decrease or, or where are you at with workload? Maybe I'll start with this. I think there's two different types of workload. There's the new incoming workload, and what we can see in the data is that uh, our new incoming claims are pre-pandemic levels, unemployment insurance, or unemployment rates are very, very low. Uh, so there's that workload. The other workload is that we are still doing work from the pandemic era. There's still cleanup work. We made good decisions to get benefits out, and with those, there are pieces uh, that we didn't do, that we now have to go back in, whether it's adding a component to the technology to uh, be able to do a thing. Um, and it's not necessarily that there wasn't shortcuts, it was there are things that we need to get out now and so we have to make some concessions. And now we're at a place where we have to go back and clean that work up. And so, which is interesting because that work also isn't visible and it isn't funded, um, but it still has to be done and it's also part of uh, our overall strategy. It falls into the UI portfolio. Thank you. And, and to Jarrah's point about the federal funding, because um, I don't know how clear you all are on how this works, but um, the federal funding at the national level that we get to run an unemployment insurance program is based off of a set of metrics, and when unemployment insurance levels are low, our unemployment insurance funding drops. And so 
Um, thank you for the question because it's a, it's a really real balancing act that we're playing and that we're still trying to do the improvement work that's needed both for the individuals that are still in that queue and the stuff we learned. Like we need to do better. We need modernized systems. The um, sophistication of fraud risk is a different threshold than we experienced before. Um, we still have the fallout of standing up multiple pandemic era programs and our federal funding is dropping. So it's just, a it's um, you're seeing our best efforts at balancing all of it, but it is a real challenge. Thank you. Um, just on the federal funding falling, which I understood and saw in the third quarter performance report, thank you for getting that forwarded, um, is the governor's request package include funding to meet the goals of your strategic plan and the various and timelines? Yeah, so we did submit a decision package <coughs> proposal to the Office of Financial Management, the governor's office, that specifically spoke about the reduction in federal funding and sought state level funding to backfill some of that. Um, ultimately, um, you know, we have a commitment to continue to work with you and continue to work with the governor's office on the reality of how this pencils out over time. We were granted in the governor's budget some pieces around some of the sprint teams that we have doing um, the um, project work, mm -hmm. um, but, but the long-term solution to this federal funding shortfall by and large is going to require some federal advocacy, continued work with our partners on how we modernize that system to be reflective of the challenges that we face. So the, um, the need is going to be greater and it's going to be longer term, but we have a commitment to continue to stay in touch um, on, on the realities of that. Yes, I'm not gonna hold my breath for federal relief in the coming year, so I encourage you to work with the appropriations and ways and means teams to get the work funded. Uh, Senator Wilson is next in question, and uh, I was derelict in not recognizing that for the record that online Representative Gaynor joined us at the beginning. <laughs> Senator Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I'm looking back at uh, page 13 from the SAO report, which talks about payment times worsened until May 20 of 21. Um, and so I'm looking now, we have our state economist, um, chief economist, I guess, has said that there is a pandemic, or a, sorry, not a pandemic, thank God, a uh, recession <laughs> on the on the yeah. horizon. <laughs> sorry, wrong word. Um, and with a recession, there's typically a loss of jobs and unemployment goes up, you'll have more claims. Are you confident that you will be in a position whenever this occurs, which could be sooner or later, we don't know, but to be prepared for this, because this is going to be, you know, another, another wave, it won't be like the pandemic where not only did they get fired from their job or they just were, their jobs were removed so that they couldn't, but they couldn't go out and get another one. This time there, that could be a possibility, but um, I'm, I just want to be, confident that we aren't going to be getting emails like Rep Orcutt just read to us in um, in those particular times. I appreciate that question, Senator Wilson. I'll start with it and then I'll open it to the team to really give you the wisdom. Um, what I, there's a couple things I have um, to say about that. One, one of the fortunate things I think about a recession versus the experience that we had with COVID is that um, it is more gradual. We see it coming. Um, I will say mm -hmm. um, that um, Rep Representative Paulette, uh, Chair, you are right about the federal government and the hope of changing, but their funding model looks in the rearview mirror. And so our funding for claims volumes is always legs behind the actual reality of where those volumes are. What's really, I think, different this time, in addition to this idea of an adjudicator core, which I don't think would necessarily be triggered in the kind of economic situation you're talking about, we do have that. We also have 
a whole lot of people in our own organization that we cross-trained. Um, at one point early, we had everybody from our employment connections, our reemployment work source side of the house um, helping, and we have um, ambassadors now in those offices, UI ambassadors, that we are keeping trained and do that work for those centers in a limited way. So we have some levers to pull that we haven't had in the past. The challenge we have, though, is how we pay those employees to do UI work if we don't have UI funding. And so I think that's the piece that we're looking at a little bit. Um, but having gone through this, having had the experience we just had, how painful uh, it was for all of us, we are more prepared. We have an economic cycle plan. So I know the um, auditor's office talked about a continuity of operations plan and that's sort of standard speak for like, how do you respond to an incident? Well, ESD has an economic cycle plan that anticipated some kind of economic swing and, and had actually gone back and looked at what happened during the Great Recession and documented, we did tabletop exercises to prepare for the next economic shock, knowing it was coming, and then the pandemic hit, and we never considered that sort of, you know, kind of experience. So we're gonna get those things updated, but in the meantime, there is a lot of, um, I think, different opportunities that we have to respond to what could very um, likely be some some kind of economic situation that would result in, in, in higher unemployment. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, but I want to lead off with, um, while I've got your attention, Commissioner, also a, a letter I received shortly before Christmas. Um, I'm a single mom of two kids who had unemployed, who had un I'm a single mom of two kids who had employment terminated. I was awarded benefits as of September 25th, 2022. As of yet, I haven't received any assistance. The SD website shows pending. I've called multiple times a day to get assistance, only to hear the online recording telling me the phone lines are overloaded and I get hung up on. I've emailed multiple times since November 15th, 2022, when my award letter was received, asking for assistance on why I haven't received payment, but I haven't received any responses. It's now 12 weeks. I drove to Mount Vernon, a one hour drive from my home. As the website showed, this was an ESD location. Uh, I was placed in front of a phone, rather than meeting with a person. Uh, I was placed in front of a phone with the same voice message center that I had calling from my home. I was able to get through and speak with an agent who told me there was fraud in 2020. I may or may not receive funding. Um, I may need to call again, at which time I'm told the phone system is broken. It's not likely I'll be able to get through again. It is two weeks before Christmas, yep. a week before Christmas a single mom. Um, uh, it's heartbreaking, and I know you're dedicated to changing that. Um, but I am a little confused about some of the things that I thought I had understood in terms of looking at the, perform the third quarter report and now hearing today. So the reserve adjudicators um, uh, are presented uh, sounding as if you've got them available and online, and maybe this is something the SAO staff would also address, but um, uh, I'm not, I understand now from the discussion that um, adjudicators are also phone line answerers. They're trained through a national center, which I assume doesn't include Washington state specific requirements, and they're not actually deployed. So we had asked for, as JLARC, a performance improvement plan with specifics. And I'm just wondering, like, at what point in time can you say, in, per a strategic plan, performance improvement plan, 95% of calls will be picked up by a human being and responded to within a reasonable time period? because that's what one would expect in a performance improvement plan, a measurable metric, 
And um, the second half of the question is, the SAO said the draft strategic plan 22 to 26 still lacks a defined actionable customer service measures. Um, and so I'm wondering from you and then to SAO, did you specifically change that in response? And are there those measures, including when a single mom will have a 95% chance of getting through on within, say, 30 minutes to a human being? And what good is the reserve if you're not deploying them? Why don't I start with the reserve, and then um, I'll let you talk about customer uh, metrics. So the reserve adjudication core is activated when our uh, claims get to a certain level that we're going to have the federal funding to pay them, right? Um, and we actually worked with our, um, the law asked us to work with the Unemployment Insurance Advisory Committee to come with them up with the methodology for when that's actually activated. That um, advisory committee has representation from um, business as well as um, labor advocates and has some at-large at positions. Um, so the scenario we're in right now would not activate that adjudication core. We will keep them trained up and ready to come in. There's one other thing I want to mention in that story that is really, the whole story is heartbreaking. Fraud has been very problematic for us. Both the attack that happened that created a lot of fraudulent claims on behalf of real people, right, this large imposter and fraud attack that it's difficult to clean up until the real person comes in. And I will say, like, it's cleaned up from the perspective that we've stopped the fraud, we've taken care of that, but it doesn't really um, trigger a, um, like, the, the full cleanup. We need the individual, um, the, the real person, and, and getting that real person. And it, it is problematic. It's a it's a double injury when that person comes in and someone has used their identity to, to file a claim. What happened to the individual that you're talking about should not have happened in terms of how we treat that and her ability to get benefits. She should have been contacted before that. And that's a follow-up. I would love a name and we'll take care of that. I would also, I just also want to, flag, like we have an exceptionally low fraud rate. We have recovered, um, we're at like 408 million of the 647, but that, those fraud protections are strong now and it impedes timely payment in many ways. And that's just one way that we've seen our timely payment suffer a bit in this shift. And we continue to have um, fraud filed it's not successful, it's not going through. Just for the record, like our fraud rate is ridiculously low and it's really um, difficult. I want um, to give JR some space to talk about your question that's really important about at what point can um, someone who needs our service pick up the phone, get through and have an experience where they get their issue resolved that's the part of your story that's really tough for me is they went, they did the right thing. They went into a center. Those phones do go straight through to provide support or they have an ambassador, one or the other, but they got a person and they didn't get their issue resolved. And that's the, mm -hmm. that's, that's like really tough to hear. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and the difference is, I think, is you're also asking in some of the data. So seeing some of the reports and us able to answer calls, and then you're getting something like this, which looks different. So uh, unemployment insurance has always had a seasonal spike. Uh, it usually happens October, November, December, where we actually see almost a doubling in the workload. So while our claim levels were pre-pandemic levels, this is a natural spike that occurs in volume. So call volumes will literally double one week to the next. 
Here's why that's significant. Historically, we have handled it through overtime. Uh, we don't have that option this year. So we're having to learn new ways to handle that spike, which is resulting in customers not getting through. And just to give you some numbers for perspective, because I'm a numbers person and I care about what this means, is the level of sophistication in our data, I know exactly how many calls one of our employees can take, which also means that I can look at call volumes and know exactly how many staff members I need to support those call volumes. For December, in order to support all of the call volumes that were coming in that month, I would have needed 138 full-time staff members doing nothing but phones. That is over half of what I have for actual staff who also need to answer the emails. You mentioned that she didn't receive a response back uh, through that process um, and to process and do the adjudication work. And so using our staffing models, it's a constant balance knowing that I can put more folks on the phones, which we've done, which is why our email responses are behind right now. Um, but I also need to keep people doing the adjudication work or it drives my calls up. This is where I'm looking at those long term, like we have to have better options. If we know this happens every year, then we should have very good plans in place to stop this from happening. And while adding additional people um, seems like the best path forward, what I do know from experience, it is the least efficient, it is the most costly, there are better ways to do this so that it is sustainable going forward. Uh, it doesn't help her and the experience that she had, um, but I hope it sheds a little bit more light on what I'm looking at and why it matters and where we need to make some big shifts and are making big shifts. So uh, there are two questions that arise here. Mm -hmm. um, one would be um, the model of having only a, the same people who are adjudicators answering phones. Yeah. Is, I mean, that seems to be a structural problem. And the second is, um, if we're only using, you know, does the state need to make an investment apart from the trust fund to pay for, you know, the benefits um, because people, um, you know, the cost to the state in human terms as well as economic terms well justifies investment apart from trust fund, it seems. That's... Maybe you're not able to answer that question. That's well, just statement is not the second, but we can answer the first in terms of part of the, we have different levels of adjudicators mm -hmm. and we really do try to hit the sweet spot because we want people to answer the phone to be able to also solve the problem and help them. Mm -hmm. And we, over the course of the pandemic, added a ton of people to the phone, like we took the dollars and we threw a bunch of people on the phone, but they couldn't really help people. They weren't trained to resolve the issues that people had on their claims. And it was very frustrating for people because they'd get a hold of somebody and it's it's what you just described where this woman got a hold of someone and she thought she hit the lottery and then that person didn't help her. So this idea about call resolution and actually being able to resolve issues because the other thing that happens is when we try to call people back, you know, they don't answer their phone. I get it. Like I don't always answer my cell phone either when people call. And so you get into this, like, how do we get a hold of this person if we are calling them back? And I'm not trying to... I'm not um, trying to make excuses, but that is the logic behind having adjudicators do, you know, um, a, a variety of this work because it often takes their decision to solve the problem that the person has. And so if they're going to, you know, go into email, it's usually about a problem like this um, woman is experiencing and we want someone that can actually resolve it. That's the theory and that's what we're really trying to do. Um, and some of these claims may have many issues on them, like many, many issues, not just one like I mischecked a box. And so yep. um, I think we're excited at least about some of the new sort of thinking we're bringing to the table around like, okay, how, how do we really, from a process perspective, um, do some of this? And I think your your question, uh, Chair Paul, was is a great one to like, okay, is there a different a different way of looking at that? But that's generally why our adjudicators are on the are on the phones and answering email and doing those things. 
But you, you did ask for a date, right? You said, yep. what's the date that yeah. we can tell you that 95% <laughs> right? And I, and I want to honor that question. Um, yeah. Obviously, none of these things can we promise um, a specific date, but our phone system going live in April that's giving us that data metric to be able to answer your question and to give us the information about who's calling so that our folks can, we're, we're better tagging the right person to speak to the right person and preventing um, the experience that this individual had where they just got a high volume message. Um, the, the elimination of that system and helping that person schedule a time that they're ready, they're not, juggling, picking up the kiddo at childcare, they're really there ready to take that call is really significant. So am I gonna say that in May, 95% of calls are completely satisfied with us? No, but I think April is a good place to start to look to um, our being able to answer differently what we know about how those calls are coming in. Thank you, and it is very exciting to hear about the implementation and having the schedule of someone who could resolve hearing, knowing what the issues are so that the right person calls them. It's very encouraging. Uh, Representative Horcutt. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So you mentioned that it's very difficult when you go to call somebody back or one of your staff goes to call somebody back and they don't answer. Um, how is that showing up on their caller ID? Um, I mean, obviously it's been in the news that um, a fairly significant state agency got hit by fraud to the tune of several hundred million dollars. Um, and we're all warned against answering phone calls from people we don't know. Mm -hmm. So how is it showing up on their caller ID or how are you telling them it's going to show up on their caller ID so that they know to answer it when it comes through? I think that's a, a great question. Um, I'm gonna have JR answer the current mode of what that looks like. So we've had a lot of conversations about that over the last period of time um, and the fact that um, a lot of fraudsters have been very sophisticated and spoofed um, our website. They've spoofed a lot of different things, um, including how we show up. And so it's a tough, when that amount of fraud gets introduced in a system, any system, um, how you untangle that's challenging. So we have been, um, We've worked a lot on our communications. Um, and JR, do you know? I don't know. No, I was going to say, I, I thought I was prepared for every question today, and I knew someone would get one that I'm like, I, I should did. actually know That's the answer right. to that. Woo, I should know winner. the answer to that. So uh, I will get the answer to that back to you. I do, um, our, our fraud unit's really sophisticated and we've worked with some companies and we usually find where that's happened very quickly and get those sites down and that kind of thing. Like we're, we have, we're out there looking for all of that. Um, but it makes our job really difficult and it makes it really hard on the people um, of Washington that depend on us for the reasons you just talked about. So I appreciate the question and we'll get back to you on that and let you know for sure. Senator Rivers, I'm sorry I had written down that you, I was supposed to call on you and Better late than never. You. Here you um, go. Uh, with respect to my colleagues and their um, their constituent concern. I think we all experienced, not a one of us, um, didn't experience some of this stuff. You ladies have been on the hot seat for quite a while now, and I appreciate your staying around. Um, I think it's a hard thing to find that balance of preventing fraud, uh, and but making sure that the people who need to get help get help. So I want you to know that I understand that. And for my colleagues up here, it wasn't so long ago that I received a communication from a prison in our state uh, who was a mother with three little children who needed money right away and didn't have a car and all of these things. And I read it and I thought, man, that can't be. So I forwarded it and thank you for catching that fraud. At the beginning, some controls were turned off mm -hmm. where we thought everyone who reached out to us was a good actor. Mm -hmm. And we knew that we had to get help is on the way and, and that's admirable and laudable. Um, I appreciate all of the things that you've done for customer service. I think it's really important. Uh, and, and I'm so sorry for your constituents who are in the angst of needing help and haven't been able to get it. But I'm really glad we're not paying people in prison. 
and I'm glad that you instituted the safeguards to make sure that that's not happening. So um, I feel like you need a little bit, <laughs> you've been through a lot today. I feel <laughs> like you need a little bit of a plus up um, and know that I appreciate that uh, we were partners in preventing that fraud for the people of this state. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Rivers. And I, I will offer, you know, that constituent process is there for a reason because we do want to help you. And I've gotten those calls mm -hmm. that were heartbreaking to find out that it wasn't the person okay. that they said they were. And I've gotten heartbreaking calls that were really that person. And they are um, handled with care by the team. And um, so please, if you get those emails, please send them through our constituent process. We're really diligent about that. Thank you, uh, Representative Berg. And I do want to just ask if SAO, after Representative Berg's question, if the SAO's team wants to say anything further before we close. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I just wanted to echo Senator Rivers' um, comments because I, I was scrolling through my emails. I've gotten a, a lot of emails um, saying thank you to my office and to yourselves. Um, I was going to read one that was heartfelt. It was handwritten. Um, had a little too much personal information in there for me to try and dig out the, the nuggets. But the good nuggets of that was you helped somebody who was in dire need. Um, they were a good actor because to Senator Rivers' point, we do get, you know, it's hard to vet. And so thank you for that service. But um, it was handwritten. Um, in, uh, in just a way that you could feel the heartbeat of the writer um, as they were putting it on paper, what they had gone through. And um, they were thankful to my office, but m more so thankful to the work that you're doing. So thank you for being on this hot seat for so long, also answering the questions and also um, helping folks when, when they need help. Because I know not everyone, um, we've heard some heartbreaking stories today, and I know there are a lot out there, but there's some folks who you've really helped. So thank you for that. Thank you, and I will pass that along to the team because they're sure working hard at it. It's been grueling, and so thank you. Um, does the state auditor's office staff want to share any closing responses to any of the questions we've had? Um, I just would have a quick response. I wanted to say that we're very heartened to hear about all of the work that it sounds like has been taking place since July, and we appreciate the work that ESD is doing in this area. Um, other than that, I have no comment. Thank you. I want to thank the SAO team, and uh, I want to echo the thanks to Commissioner and the ESD team for being so patient, and I just want to say um, your caring comes through, and we really appreciate it. Um, it seems to me that one of the things that we've got responsibility to look at as legislators is how to make sure you have the resources to do the things that you are hoping you can do and aren't constrained. Um, so that's a conversation that I think, as legislators, we need to have um, because uh, the federal resources, I know, have diminished, as you've said, um, and they're not going to make those investments that we probably need to make. And it is probably more important for us uh, to make that so that a single mother doesn't become homeless and then become put in a position where we are spending far more money um, from health to housing um, if we can do the provide the service that all the people at ESD are trying to provide. So with that, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Chair Paula. We appreciate the time, and I just want to offer we are available anytime. So if you ever have a question or you want to meet or there's want an update from us, we are um, here available and willing. So thank you for the time today. And the quarterly reports are sent to us. <laughs> just, <laughs> just want to make sure people know. Um, yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with that, um, does anyone have any good for the order? Um, Keenan, are you about to I'm, I'm head out? To you're, you're clicking <laughs> off. And um, again, our greatest appreciation for 31 years of service. Okay, and the meeting is adjourned. <laughs>